For those of you here in Orlando and the rest of you listening on Share Live, wherever you happen to be in the world, welcome to the joint MVS LVM program opening. I'm Ed Jaffe from Phoenix Software International, together with Skip Robinson from Southern California Edison. We manage the MVS program here at Share, and Rick Barlow manages the LVM program here at Share. Now, we're talking about 60 years of share, and, and last year it was 50 years in the mainframe. Now, I don't go <laughs> back to core memory or anything like that, but I do feel like I was born at kind of a good time, and I got into the industry at a good time because, for me, I was able to learn as a junior application programmer a lot of stuff that today is the purview of you know, real engineers, people that work on hardware and operating systems and stuff like that. because. I mean, back then, you, you, uh, you had to know the data representation, how your data was being represented, what instructions were being used to manipulate it. Uh, it helped to know CKD architecture, blocks, tracks, and cylinders, and stuff like that. Um, it helped to understand how, what virtual memory was and how you could adjust your reference patterns to decrease your real storage footprint. Um, and. Uh, a number of other things like that. We used to debug our programs looking at dumps, you know. I mean, big, well, later years it was, you know, on these, on white paper that was laser, but before that it was great big green bar, you know, impact print. It was as thick as the LA phone book, and half of what you were looking at was MBS control blocks. So you were learning the operating system as you were just debugging your, you know, rookie uh, application. So. Uh, that just shows me how much things have changed, because today, the rookie Java programmer coming in, maybe they've got some kind of a web service that's REST. His job, there's a, uh, his or her job, they have a, uh, maybe a JSON payload coming in, it needs to be parsed. Once they figure out what that is, use some, some uh, Java classes that have the right methods they need to, to fulfill the request, and then repackage it back up as JSON, send it on back down the wire. Any I.O. they're looking at is, you know, just a stream of bytes, it's not, records, blocks, and tracks, and, and stuff like that. So big, big changes. And, you know, uh, memory. The memory, I mean, I, these days with the, with the way that uh, uh, the costs on memory are on Z13, I've heard that there are some customers that are increasing their memory footprints by an order of magnitude. So a lot of those considerations, things that mattered back then, don't matter at all right now for that, for that rookie programmer. And that just shows how much things have changed. And they've changed a lot. They're going to continue to change as long as this platform remains viable. And I think the key is that if it stops changing, the platform won't be viable. So I think it's incumbent upon key individuals, people in this room, and all the people that somehow ended up in the other room, uh, to, uh, to anticipate that change, to embrace that change, to stay open-minded. and. Uh, which brings me to, to today's guest, uh, Chris O'Malley. He's the president and CEO of CompuWare. I remember Chris from his days as general manager over at CA Technologies. And, um, <laughs> and Chris is here to uh, articulate for us his uh, sort of uh, strategic and tactical vision about uh, 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 with a roadmap for change that will help this platform uh, remain viable and uh, stay healthy for many, many years to come. So uh, please join me in welcoming Chris O'Malley to the stage. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, we got 52 minutes left, and I have a habit of talking too much. So uh, I'm going to go fast at the beginning, but we'll slow down. I'm going to spend the first part of this chat uh, talking about what I think to be the biggest issue facing the mainframe today. And as we were just talking about, the fact that the mainframe has a lot of opportunity to do great things within IT, but if we don't get the velocity, the change, the inspiration, I think we got a big problem. Then I will be joined by a panel of four industry experts that are going to come up and share their perspective on what I just had talked about, plus give their encouraging words to you in terms of what could be done to make the mainframe better. So I'm going to start first, giving kind of my my, my sense of the state of the mainframe. First, the Z13 came out earlier this year. I think uh, Tom talked about it earlier today. 
extremely successful. A lot of excitement came out of it. They've done a fantastic job in terms of keeping the f speeds and feeds a step ahead of the market. You know, the transactional rates that are going through, our customers are going through, are constantly, constantly growing. And IBM has done a fantastic job for 50 years of constantly staying ahead of that rate of change. They've also done some magnificent things in terms of the design of the box to anticipate what's coming. Uh, in the mobile world, especially in the back end on the system of record, it's going to have significant implications for which the mainframe has got to respond to. So they've done a great effort there in terms of basically helping to support mobile. There's also use cases that are expanding in terms of the mainframe in terms of analytics. I'm sure that Tom spent some time this morning talking about it. But in the analytics space, increasingly as companies are competing in the digital economy, you know, salespeople and marketing people are clearly understanding that you compete in these quick transient moments. And these transient moments come and go in a matter of seconds or minutes. And if you look at the way analytics are done today, almost often it's taking data off the system of record, which is usually the mainframe, putting it in some other place off the mainframe, which usually doesn't fix the controls with it, so it creates a, an opportunity for risk or for fraud. It then runs through a lengthy ETL process that for many customers, given the volume of data, can take hours, even days. It finally gets into a Hadoop platform, and then these tools that are called real-time analytics do their work. Usually, um, you know, that is now days later in terms of those insights. So when these real-time analytics or these vendors talk about it, what they're really saying is they're giving you fast access to old data. So marketing people and salespeople are looking at that and saying that's not the answer. We gotta get the insights closer to being done in minutes and even in seconds. That time has gotta be compressed. So the physics of it all, require that you move the analytics effort closer to the system of record. So even though the Hadoop zealots and x86 zealots would say it is heresy that, that you'd run analytics on the mainframe, I think economics and business issues are gonna drive more and more customers to look at doing that. So again, IBM needs to be given a huge amount of credit, especially the hardware team, in making this platform incredibly relevant. So that is from a speeds and feeds perspective in terms of the market, and Tom may have mentioned this, but in the last six months, year over year, IBM grew their revenues by 50% on the mainframe platform. And again, people that are doubters would say they were at the end of a cycle, you know, last or a year ago, now they're at the beginning of a cycle and there should be a significant gain in terms of the base of revenue. But 50% is a lot, especially in the course of this economy. And I think it shows a commitment of mainframe customers that have those technologies today to continue to embrace it and be a part of their strategic platforms within enterprise IT. We also did a survey of 350 CIOs, and I'm going fast, but I, I gotta get through this part quickly. We did a survey of 350 CIOs um, recently. More than 80% of them said they were gonna use the mainframe for more than 10 years, actually 89%. More than 80 said that they were going to do, do strategic efforts on the mainframe in the years to come. And 80%, more than 80% said there's new workloads going to the mainframe. So again, this is a reaffirmation that the mainframe is doing very well, probably the best it's done in, in maybe 10 years. So taking a step beyond that, customers, you've got Visa and Citibank that are talking about the fact that in competing in the digital economy, they're looking to use the mainframe more aggressively. And these articles being written about them are not in Information Week and Computer World. This is in the Wall Street Journal and Forbes. And it's not the CIOs talking, it's actually CEOs talking about it. So there's a clear recognition by CEOs that they know that technology has gotta be an integral part of what they do basically to serve their customers, get new business, and the density of that is introducing them to the mainframe as being the best and right choice. So all good things, and some would say some of the best of times for the mainframe. So uh, the alternatives to the mainframe, and uh, I like to affectionately call this this incomprehensibly complex distributed hairball that vendors want you to believe can be made into a bunch of pieces and parts that equals a mainframe. Now, I'm not saying that distributed products are bad fundamentally. I mean, in terms of system of engagement, they are the best choice. But when you try to remake those pieces and parts into something that starts to try to equal a mainframe, bad things are starting to show themselves as it not being the right answer. So I wanna just give a couple of examples that I think are important. 
There's a major governmental agency that you probably read about in the last month or so that has significant breach where 22 million people's records got basically absconded with. Um, in terms of the research that I've done in this, in terms of reading, as well as just some of the insights I've gotten from individuals that are more closely aware, this is an organization that spent years and years and years trying to get that workload off the mainframe onto a distributed platform. Years and years trying to do this effort. And what happens most often, because this is like an old history lesson that people never learn from, as they go through that effort, eventually they find it's more complex, it's harder than they thought, it doesn't do all the things that they did on the mainframe formally, so they're constantly, given that somebody at a senior level has made that decision, throwing good money after bad, trying to get this thing to keep the promise it had at the outset. Eventually what happens is you can't go up the organization for more money, so you have to go sideways, horizontally, within your own budget. So what they tend to do is they start starving things within IT to throw good money after bad at this effort to get off the mainframe. And those things usually manifest themselves in starving the mainframe specifically. They don't do maintenance. They don't upgrade the systems. I mean, this becomes rusty and antiquated. And you get yourself in this very awkward situation where you have two cul-de-sacs. You cannot go forward easily. It doesn't look like even throwing good money after bad and throwing more complexity on it. You're going to get a good outcome with the strategy you've taken. But now you've done so little in what you formally ran, you can't go back. Now, when you go through, go before a Senate committee and you make arguments to try to defend that by blaming the legacy, that usually doesn't go too well. People can see through it. And it ends very, very badly. In this case, certainly it did. But What's lost in the news is the collateral damage that this created is outrageous. These 22 million records are not credit card numbers, which is not trivial. These are the, the, basically the, the answers and, and answers to questions that people have given to get secret clearances and top secret clearances in the United States of America. It's gotten to the point where the Chinese government knows more about me than Axiom. And that's a problem. That's a problem, and we look at it like it's passing news. New York Stock Exchange went down for hours in the middle of the day. No big deal. Oh well. Lucky for them, an airline went down on the exact same day. So at least cut the news in half. It diluted the <laughs> scrutiny on them for the day. Now unfortunately for the airline, that was the second time that they had gone down in a little over a month. It was such a big deal that the President of the United States of America has to be briefed on it. Now, it's one thing to do a mea culpa to your executive management to say, I'm sorry that the systems went down. It's another thing to start off that conversation by saying, dear Mr. President, this is a big deal. This is not a little deal. This is a big deal. And the analysts are picking up on this. You know, it's, you know it's, I wrote a blog about the mainframe as a witch and people just have cast stones on it as being something that's bad as opposed to something that's not. Um, and I think a lot of customers and analysts perpetuated that kind of thought process within the market. But I'm seeing analysts now. Gartner just came out with a briefing note, and it talks about the moribund state of the IBM mainframe migration market. And basically, to paraphrase it, you know, customers are saying that if everybody's getting off the mainframe, why are the people that do it, that do the actual conversions, dying? I mean, there's, there's no viable choices in the market actually to do it. And I won't, let, I won't steal the thunder, and I encourage you to read it, but you know, this is the deal. When you take a complex system on the mainframe, that for 50 years you've gotten to work, taken all the bugs out of it, and done all the right things in terms of the best thought process and put it into it, and it run, runs on a platform that just works, right? It's secure, it's reliable and you rewrite it, you expose yourself to all kinds of risks. You're starting from scratch. And now you're running in a platform that's never been proven to equal the mainframe. No wonder they're having so much problems and there's no references. And I challenge the analysts that for every example you can give me of somebody doing it, which probably had more to do with luck and limited use of the mainframe, I can give you dozens of examples of people who have failed, multiple CIOs fired, in trying to make this effort. So again, trying to remake these pieces and parts on the distributed side into a mainframe does not work. And it's not to say that distributed is bad. I'm not a zealot that thinks the mainframe can do everything.
but there's a place for both of these platforms. And what runs on the mainframe should continue to run on the mainframe. The last thing I want to talk about is cost. Um, you know, the, the, you know, in every conversation I get with every reporter, this comes up. Mainframes are really expensive, you know, and, and you know, you can, mainframes are a million dollars and a, and a server's like 15 cents. And this kind of naive perspective of not looking at it as apples to apples has always been problematic. Um, you know, there's a, a, a big cost of entry, if you will, to get in the mainframe, or a relatively big cost of entry in the mainframe. But when you think about these things, you've got to think of a equal scale. And until more recent history, you couldn't do that. There wasn't the equivalent on the distributed side that you could point to, understand the total cost of ownership, and actually compare it to the mainframe. Well, there's this man named Dr. Howard Rubin, who's an IT economist. Um, he's been studying this for years. He just recently updated that study. And he's shown that companies in contrast, that are dominated by mainframe versus light and light and distributed versus those who are dominated by distributed and light and mainframe, he's tracked them over five years. And as this note says down below, that the cost for those that are dominated by distributed, light and mainframe, have had 65 or 63% higher cost than those that are dominated by mainframe and light and distributed. So the mainframe is not just cheaper, it's outrageously cheaper. And he makes an incredible point in the white paper that he wrote that when you think about the mobile world and this digital economy, the density of technology is massive on the back end. If you make the wrong decision of where to put the back end for mobile, if you make the wrong decisions in terms of the workloads that come off that main, you can create a cataclysmic event in terms of your IT cost structure. So this is empirical evidence, not hype, not hearsay. So again, I encourage you, if you Google the surprising t economics of mainframe, you can both, both see a YouTube example of it, uh, as well as the white paper, and I encourage you to read it. So here I gave you the state of the mainframe. You know, the good of what's happening on the mainframe side in terms of the, the, the Z13, the contrasting perspective that those are trying to remake a hairball, and it's something that equivalently does what a mainframe is. So if you hear that, you would think, we're doing pretty good, that the IBM Z13 and the platform is rocking. You could almost get overconfident that the future looks bright and rosy, and from this moment forward, the mainframe should have a resurgence. I don't believe that. I actually don't believe it for one minute. So what I believe, and, and there's going to be a segment of this thing that's going to be tough to hear for people, but uh, bear with me. Uh, I believe that we have gotten so good so good at what we do in terms of reliability, security, you know, efficiency, that we have been blinded to what needs to be done to get this platform to be more dominant in enterprise IT. You look at these questions that I put up. These are inconvenient questions for a guy like me because <laughs> there's no good answers. You know, this is like uh, a Fox News debate, you know, and, and I'm the president of the United States, or what, a candidate. These are the questions you don't want, because there's no good answers to them. Why? Why is there no good answers to these questions? And I believe it's apathy. It's absolute apathy across the entire industry. It's vendors, it's customers, it's dudes like me, it's analysts. They're not doing their part to go beyond all of those great things that we've done, right, the, the security, the reliability, to now bridge the mainframe into the future by challenging ourselves to make this platform agile and nimble with a resolve of inventing on the platform again so we can coexist with the second platform, with the third platform, to create amazing opportunity for large enterprises to compete in the digital economy. So the digital economy, I want to talk about that first, because you know, a lot of people would just say, hey, we're doing great. What's the urgency, man? We can wait. We can wait on a common install. We can wait on this. We can wait on that. What's the hurry? What's the hurry? And I want to give you kind of this essence of what is happening in the digital economy that helped me to kind of grasp why you know, we at, at CompuWare, as an example, have to work so hard. So, I met with an executive vice president of a financial services company. 
And he was talking to me about just the, the kind of the nature of IT and where it was at. And he made this point to me that, you know, our board, the board of our company, is extremely worried about being Googled. I'm like, what does that mean? Are they searched on the internet? I would really worry about that, but it's probably happening. But that wasn't it. He said, if you think about these companies like Amazon and Apple and Google and Uber, I mean, these are, I mean, I'm just, I've given a litany here, but I mean, there's a, there's a ton of them. You could, you could, this list is endless. They all kind of do the same thing, and this is him talking to me, that they take themselves as a business, a model, a thought, an innovative thought, and they insert themselves between customers and suppliers. And they, as an organization, become fanatical about customer engagement, customer service, customer experience. And for whatever value prop that they offer to that market, they start amassing a customer base increasingly over time. All right? And those customers are raving about those companies. I mean, they love them. And they create this intimacy and scale that at some point they have so many customers that now they can start dictating terms down into the suppliers. The first stage of that effort is to take profits. If you want to use the channel that I've built, the customers that love me, you got to give me a piece of the pie. It's got to come this way. The second thing they do is they come as, become a supplier themselves. So if you think about Google, it's between customers and ad agencies. They've built a massive company by basically taking that profit away from television, state, any, anything else that was a supplier of those things to, to customers. If you think about Apple, Apple, you know, in terms of the phones, is, is between customers and wireless companies. But that Apple Pay is another game they're playing. They want all of you to change your human behavior, to leave your wallet at home and just use that phone to buy stuff. And when you get to a certain, or the collectively, when the market gets to a certain tipping point, I'm assuming it's inevitable that Apple will come out with a 2.5% you know, credit card, and it will shake the credit card industry to its core. That's what being Googled is. And the point was is to think that this stops, right? That the last thing that happens is people that want rides and people that get rides, and then it just ends, is, is lunacy. That things are coming in. You've got robo-advisors now that are trying to basically do that same thing in terms of the financial services industry. So he goes, my concern is that in this world, it used to be the big beat small. Now big doesn't beat small anymore. It's fast beat slow. But he said, if we could be big and we could be fast, now that would rock. We could win anything. But then I look at my IT organization. You know, my IT organization, if I really think about it, has been doing the same things for 50 years. I mean, it's automating the same time. We've used better technology, smarter ways of doing it. You know, we've done everything better that you could do. But these dudes invent stuff. They build new products. They insert themselves and create customer experience. They're so far afield from what we do. You could see why they take, get every day counting for them and every day counts against us because we're just not agile and nimble enough. And if I look inside of IT and I look at the one thing that is the most you know, hardened and unwilling to change and uses all of these reasons as to why we can't, it's the mainframe group. And the mainframe group more than any other would give us that big advantage if in fact I could make them agile, agile and nimble. But it's not obvious for me as a CIO or an executive vice president what to do. This is a cultural issue more than anything else. What do I do? So I want to use CopyWare as an example of what we did. Because um, I think it's helpful. Uh, and I think it's helpful in kind of giving IT a sense of what would need to be done to make this, excuse me, to make this work. So I came to Copyware just over a year, like a year and two weeks ago. And I, I came having worked at, as a general manager of CA for a long period of time. I was also a, a startup of a, of a big data company. That was basically the bridge between CA and Copyware. And I came to the opportunity in large part because I thought, man, if you could take this awesome company that's incredible at application development, you know, application performance, application testing, and marry it with a startup mentality, you could reinvent the company, certainly, but I think you could reinvent the market. So I took everything that I learned on both sides and very rapidly, starting at the job, I took the team and we looked at the good and the bad and the ugly about CompuWare. 
We looked at the good and the bad and the ugly about the industry. And we synthesized it down. And we found a vision and a mission and a strategy that we feel comfortable as a team that we could rock the world with. So like a startup CEO, I got on stage over and over again in front of the team, getting them cranked about the vision, getting them cranked about the strategy, getting cranked about the mission, to the point where I felt like I could get people to change. Because behind all of those thoughts was 25 separate initiatives that I wanted to launch simultaneously into the company. And now this is not IT. This is marketing, this is sales, this is every facet of the company. I wanted to create a startup across everything. One of the things, just one, was to go to quarterly drops so that every quarter we could bring a new product to market on the first business day of the quarter and updates to all of our legacy classic technology. There was two reasons I wanted to do that. One is, is that mainframe customers, rightly so, are very cynical towards mainframe vendors. I mean, because we lie. <laughs> we constantly say we're going to do things, and we don't do things. Uh, and I understood that you got to make bold promises and keep them over an extended period of time to regain that trust. And I also wanted to demonstrate to the market it could be done. That this idea that everything has to take 18 months and 24, that is a bunch of hooey. There's nothing in, in, in ingrained in the mainframe that prevents you from creating cycle times that are much faster. And I want to prove that to the market. The second thing is, in order to do that, we had to go Agile, actually a hybrid of Agile to do it. But this is a, I mean, I just want to make, this is a small project way down here amongst 25 things that we're doing. A month into this effort to change, and I was very aggressive in the course of events with, with Agile. We had, the company had a plan over three years to get to Agile before I showed up. I said, I'll be damned, we're gonna do it in a week. And, and we're gonna do it in a way that we're gonna burn all the boats. We're, there is no going back. Everything we do, everything is going to be agile. Because I knew from my experiences at former companies, if you give them any lifeboats, they're going to take them. They're, they're going to go back and they'll create a bunch of gravity in the business that allows you, won't get you to go, go forward. So it was very aggressive. And if you've ever been through this, it's, it's not just the training that gets you there. It's the culture. It's the excitement. It's people understand because everybody's job changes in a material way. So I want you to think, I did that in a company that for 40 years had done things a certain way. 40 years. So about a month into it, I get a knock at my door. It's one of the first employees of CompuWare. He's an individual contributor, has been there since almost day one. And he sits down and he says, Chris, I love everything you're doing. It makes all the sense in the world. I mean, you've brought all this passion and excitement back to the company. I mean, I feel like it's like the first week I was at the job again. And all those things you're doing across all the other, in marketing and sales and finance, totally makes sense to me. All of this makes incredible sense to me. But this agile thing, that's really naive. I mean, and you're kind of showing that you don't get it, Chris. That, you know, when we were back 40 years ago, starting copy, we were, it wasn't called agile, it wasn't hyped like that, but it was kind of what we did. I mean, we kind of fashioned stuff, showed it to customers, came back and forth. But over the years, we learned from a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. And we've incorporated all of those mistakes into better ways to do things. And we've created this thing, we don't call it waterfall, but it's kind of like waterfall, that has proven itself to be a contributing factor in the viability of the platform, the security of it, the quality. We are a significant contributor to that. Chris, I'm a guy that helped us to be the dominant, the number one vendor in the tool sets in the market. This is a mistake. This is a mistake. Stop this. So, you know, you kind of learn as a, a leader, you get these moments that are bigger than two individuals. I mean, it's, this is a vision and whether a culture can move in a way that's going to make the company better. It's not just the two of us in that room in one sense. So what I said back to the individuals first, you got to stop lying to yourself. You got to stop lying to yourself. Because your disposition not to want to change unconsciously you're trying to manifest it that by changing, that somehow the world will end. That's for your good. That's not for the good of the platform. I'm not asking you to give up on all those virtues that have mainframe, or made the mainframe so successful. I'm asking you to add to those virtues and help to invent ways 
for us to not lose it and be agile and be nimble. And I beg the guy, please, please, don't have your legacy to this company as the last thing that you do be an obstructionist towards the end to get us over that bridge. I want you to help us to build that bridge and get over it because this moment is on loan to the future. If you and I can't figure this out and we can't build that bridge, a guy like you that's 18 won't get the opportunity that you had. That these customers that are counting on these mainframes for the next decade, I give that, they're gonna fail. But build that bridge with me. It was a bad end to that story. He didn't make it. He did not make it. He could not take off that coat of all those rational reasons as to why we shouldn't move forward. But for every one person like that at CompuWare, there were 50, there were 75, there were 100 that got excited about that vision, excited about that mission, and bought into the strategy and became part of remaking the company. So do not tell me you can't change the culture. CompuWare is proving it every single day, every single day. The second thing I'll talk about is, is the Agile. Um, it's, and, I, and I didn't hear Tom's presentation. I heard that bimodal IT slightly came up. I'll just make a quick point that uh, I think that's a bunch of hooey. The concept of the fact there has to be two different kinds of IT. And, I mean, remember what I said earlier. If I can be big and fast, I win. You've got to be both. So you have to take advantage of all the collective assets within IT. Bimodal IT is basically an excuse for poor leadership in IT and giving poor leadership a route to make sense of the fact that they can't lead the entire organization. It is wrong, because it's in the fact that you can use the asset of the mainframe that you can thrive. So let me just talk about Agile um, real quick and why it's, it's so important. So I talked about Apple with Apple Pay, right? So there's the people at all of these credit card companies that watch Apple Pay and everything they're doing. They're frantic, you know, with, what are they doing to get customer service to be better and change people's behavior? So they're just constantly thinking of cycling applications, especially mobile apps, to constantly keep up with that rate of change. Because they're somewhat in a defensive posture because Apple does it better, so they gotta be constantly looking out, but they gotta go really fast, plus invent other things to keep and hold the bonds with their customers. So they're like a skill saw in terms of their application development efforts. Right? And, and their ability to compete against Apple rests in the fact that they can use the system record right? and use it in a way that creates and enriches that experience because we're using real data at scale, the live data at scale. So if those guys who are running on a skill saw come back to the mainframe people, and the mainframe people are like this old millstone that just kind of goes like this. And these debates about, you know, we know you're like the Wild West, and we know that you, if you do those things, you're going to have the system go down. And, and these two worlds come in contact. What do you think happens? Sparks go everywhere. They go, I mean, it's an incongruent culture. You have a cultural conflict. Now, if these guys don't get their needs met, what happens? The mainframe doesn't sing and dance at a rate that equals me. We don't get the big part. I can be fast, but I'm crippled in terms of my value prop because of the stuff that's the most value that makes us different I can't use. I lose. So if you don't make a harmonious set of processes between you know, the, the, the third platform and the mainframe, it ain't gonna work. So there's gotta be acceptance of going agile. And again, it's not like the hokey pokey, you know, you turn yourself around and that's what it's all about. It's not just training people in Agile. It is about getting them excited and innovative and pumped up towards the ends of helping their companies to thrive in this digital economy. And the last thing I'll talk about is tools. Um, you know, the, when, you, when you starve the mainframe, <laughs> which too often people do, and again, you know, I'm talking about the fact you have to have this culture that's inspired inventors. You gotta have this fast pace of agile. You know, it's gotta move fast. You gotta run at rates that are equal to what they do on the mobile side, at least more closely to what they do on the mobile side. You know, if you give them crappy tools from 1965 towards that end, this doesn't work. It's like getting people excited in the locker room and then they get it pumped up, they wanna take on the team and the door's locked. You gotta give them the tools that live up 
basically to the expectations created by that culture, by those processes that are absolutely a necessity to make this thing work. And this idea of giving mainframe people inferior tools to save a buck at the expense of productivity is like cutting off your right foot to get your weight down so you can run on the 100 meter dash faster. It just doesn't make any sense. So when you start getting these three things to line up, I just want to give you, and then we'll have the panel come up. Uh, I, when you get all these things right, I want you to know what happens. I'll just give you an example. This is what happened at CompuWare this last month. So I give town halls all the time. You know, it's, it, we run it like a startup, and, and I'm constantly begging our employees, there's got to be good ideas in here that because of the way we ran the business and you know, nobody wanted to take any risks, that you never actually brought them forward, but there's got to be something in those brains out there that you could bring forward that we could use. So there's a file aid developer that's been a file aid developer for over 30 years at the company. For over 30 years. It's individual contributor working on file aid. He is now living in this world that's agile, faster. I mean, so he's seeing that even though he's extremely experienced, he knows this like a child, right? They grew up from birth. He's now having difficulty keeping up. And he saw in that problem an opportunity that if I had a certain kind of tool, I could do a lot better. So he started thinking about it and thinking about it. He fashioned that idea into a product idea. So he comes and schedules an appointment, comes into my office, it's six o'clock at night, it's on July 8th, presents this idea. It's a business case for product. It's actually better than, with all due respect to Sam, <laughs> in terms of the, the recommendation fully in terms of the business case, the technology, it was awesome. And I looked at it and it's one of those situations where you know this is big. This is big, and we gotta do something with this. Now, the old CompuWare would have said, man, Gary, this is an awesome idea. We have this thing called a backlog, and I'm gonna put it in it, and in a year, when we get done with this current waterfall cycle, we'll look at it, and if we do it, maybe a year from then, we'll have it done. In two years, you might be having a product in our hands as a result of your thoughts. The new CompuWare said, screw it. You know, we got a product council meeting in two weeks. Could you do this tomorrow? I'll move it up. So we convened all our product managers in a room the next day. He presented this idea to them. They got excited about it. They saw it as the way I saw it. This is an awesome idea. So they put that thought and everything that he built and the ideas that we had onto Confluence, which is our kind of shareware internally that we, or excuse me, our, 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 uh, our uh, communication tool that we use internally, basically get the, you know, full company input on it. Over the course of the next three, more than 20 people and 120 ideas were put into Gary's idea to fashion it into a minimum viable product that we thought would be awesome for the market. We had enough data at that point for Monday for them to create a prototype. So he basically screen layouts as to what this would be. Over the next two days, we talked to five customers in two continents. Got full feedback because of the depth of understanding and so much feedback from the entire company. Those, the quality of those conversations were deep enough that on Thursday of that week, we said, let's do it. The next week, we allocated resources because we can do that in the context of an agile, in a, in a, in a, basically an organization that can morph itself. And then the next Tuesday, we were shovel ready to build a product. That product will be released on October 1st. You tell me one company on the planet, forget big, small, that could do something that quickly. And I promise you, this company, or the com company will work and move heaven and earth to make that happen. But that's a demonstration of the possibilities of this platform. So do not let people tell you, we cannot have a culture that can be passionate and basically take this platform forward or invent on it. Do not tell me that people can't change and move to an agile culture. And you gotta be, as a company, as these companies, be willing to invest, give these people the tools to rise up to that scale. So I'm gonna bring up the panel. Come on up, guys. So we have uh, first Joe Vogel, who's the Director of Application Development and Support for Black Knight Financial Services. Jason Bloomberg, who's an industry analyst for IntelliX. He's also a contributing writer to Forbes. Connor Bratton, who's a developer at CompuWare, a new millennial that started a little more than a year ago. And Keith Siston, who direct, is Director of Technical Service for CompuWare. He runs our mainframe platform. Thank you guys for coming up. So, you know, I made the point that the three things that kill this apathy virus once and for all is 
You got to have a rock, rock, you know, a, a innovative culture, excited, as, inspiring, passionate. That you got to, you got to change the way you do things. You got to go to things like agile, accept the change that's required, and then the tooling side of it. That you got to get the right tools to support kind of these new age efforts within the uh, the mainframe world. So I'll start first. Thoughts on how do you get a passionate culture around the mainframe? So at, uh, at CompuWare, as you started to talk about, we decided we have to do something that's going to affect our culture, and that's a really big project to try to overcome. And um, as Chris was mentioning, it's really coming up with that vision. You start with that vision and a strategy, but it can't just be words on a paper. It can't just be something. It has to be really the truth. It has to be something that everybody can believe in. And then you take that, that vision and understanding, and then you challenge people to fulfill things. You challenge them to be innovative. You challenge them to move from the currency only, maintenance only mode to the innovative, new ideas, new faster approaches mode. Um, and then then as a company, the leaders have to be agile enough, not agile process, but lowercase agile enough to listen and react to the feedback. Hey, this is working, this isn't working. You have to let people have ideas that might not be Gary's idea, might not be that good, and that's not a problem. We'll look at it, we'll investigate it, we'll move forward, but it's a safe, energetic platform. We found out that with IT, most of the programmers are very innovative people in general. They came into that business because they wanted to be creative. So that all is what caused the momentum. Awesome, other thoughts? Well, at uh, Intellix, our focus is agile digital transformation, which means that uh, we focus on quite a bit more than the mainframe world, but really uh, helping enterprises connect the dots across the spectrum of everything that goes into that story of digital transformation. So uh, this is my first time at SHARE, so I, I deserve a green, green badge, but I speak at uh, cloud conferences, DevOps, uh, you know, ma microservices, all sorts of different topics. And uh, one of the most important trends in enterprise IT today uh, is how to break down the silos, not just across the enterprise, but even within IT. And that's one of the challenges that is, has always impacted the mainframe organization is, is it's ends up being siloed and, uh, as well as the other silos and then you end up with this adversarial us versus them where it's not about cooperation, it's about everybody in their own world, their own budgets, their own priorities. So one of the, one of the key uh, cultural trends that is helping to break this down is a focus on empathy. So it's interesting, you get a room full of techies, you know, uh, talking about empathy, but that, that's becoming is increasingly important, where empathy is essentially uh, putting yourself in the other person's shoes and understanding how to help them meet their priorities. And if everybody across the organization takes that perspective, then you can help, uh, you know, sort of re reorganize that culture from a, an adversarial uh, relationship to much more of a cooperative relationship. And this is fundamental to the movement toward DevOps, you know, the continuous delivery mode where de development and operations are coming together. And it's a, a fundamental part of making sure that moving into the 21st century, the mainframe team is every bit a part of the digital effort as any, any other part of, of the organization. And that's a fundamental part of the story, especially now as we're sort of moving into uh, uh, more and more millennials uh, becoming part of the, the mainframe world. Uh, they don't want to be off in a world only doing mainframe stuff, right? It's all part of the same story. And that's an important part of attracting and retaining the best people. Joe Connor. Any thoughts? I think a, another key for culture was the support of the idea of fail fast. You know, we've been, mainframe developers have been in this environment for so long where failure was never an option, so you had all these checks and balances to make sure nothing ever went wrong, and you just don't have the time to do that. You need to be able to fail, get back up, and get another idea out the door. And that's something that, you know, it's a support from executives and management, you know, a mindset change. Yeah, when you, when you invent stuff, you gotta, you gotta accept the risk that comes with inventing stuff. And you know, the mainframe, if it's a world of currency, right, and maintenance, uh, you know, things like you know, that you know, risk averse kind of perspective is highest order. When you're trying to build brand new stuff, you gotta accept some scale of risk. I mean, that's an important part of actually moving forward. And it's difficult for people to get their heads around it, but it's an important part. You can't, you can't hide from it, you gotta accept it. 
Joe, you're going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, um, I mean, we're in, in our company, we're starting to move towards, you know, an agile development or, or some hybrid of it. Um, and, you know, we've got those two camps, those traditional two camps, you know, of mainframers and, and distributed. You know, the distributed side, they look at the mainframe side and think it's a big old black box. And, you know, the mainframe guys, you know, uh, you know, we tease the distributed side that says, well, you know, the, the big server is working today. How about your little server? Um, so, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a perception problem between the two camps. So a lot of it, you know, we find is, you know, it's, it's training. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, our, our management staff leading the way, showing and say, well, this is the direction that we need to go. And, and, and both camps learning the different sides, mentoring each other, understanding how the different parts work, so that way we can all work a little bit faster and it's not you know, quite confusing as far as where we need to go. Awesome. So the second thing I said, I, I'm, I'm a strong advocate that you gotta go to Agile. I mean, to invent stuff, you gotta put it in the market, get feedback, bring it back, refashion. I mean, if the cycle time in doing that is a year or 18, forget it. I mean, it's just, the market is moving too fast, the demands of customers are too aggressive in terms of what we do right now. You gotta go faster, but I'd like your perspective. Is that, is that right, is that wrong? Who would like to answer that first? I, I, I would, uh, I'll start. Um, you know, the, the old waterfall approach, you know, is of course, you know, decades old. And back then, it's like what we try to tell, you know, some of our older folks, it's like, you didn't have the tool sets that you have now. You didn't have, you know, the IDEs that when you sit down and you're coding, it's auto-correcting and, and helping you and figuring things out. You didn't have the tools to, to figure out the inventory of your product on an instantaneous basis. So you had to do a lot of that waterfall approach of that heavy, deep analysis of what code needs to be changed, all the different parts and pieces, and slowly do it so you don't break anything. But now you have so much of your, your data inventory and, and your processes integrated that you can, you can code quickly, you can code fast, and, and, and figure out what's not working and, and, and with the various automated testing tools and stuff like that. So it's like you can get to that point a lot faster and they start to see it's like, oh, okay, I understand that, you know, that's right, it's, it's not in the old style. You know, we're thinking that, that we had to do it in that way, but really we don't anymore. One of the things that we do actually at CompuWare to just make people understand that there's a direct correlation, like you're saying, to their efforts and the impact it's having in the business. We have a huge bell in Detroit, and all of us, the developers on one floor, every time we get a new deal, a new customer, we ring that bell. And part of what we're trying to do is get people to start associating what they're doing with the results within the company. And when that thing rings you know, four or five times a day, it gets them juiced up that uh, you know, what I'm doing is fast, fast contributing to the business. So other thoughts on the agile side of it and the need to... What, you, what I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, it's important to remember that the, you know, if the alternative to agile is waterfall, Waterfall, depending upon which report you read, fails 85 to 90 percent of the time. Right? Either projects go over budget, they um, they go over time, or they just don't deliver on their requirements. So uh, you have to think about well, which is really riskier? Is it taking an agile approach is it maybe untried in your organization? You have to learn different things, and there's a certain level of sort of uh, seat of the pants to it that that sounds a little bit risky. But compare that to waterfall, which is almost guaranteed to fail. Well, there's more risk there, right? Uh, and you have to factor in the, the broader context of risk. And in today's world, uh, the, there's the risk of not innovating well enough or fast enough, the opportunity risk that is lost by playing it too safe. So playing it safe is actually riskier than taking some risk. So just as Connor was saying, you have to fail fast. You have to get good at taking risks. And of course, risks mean that, that you, know, you don't always succeed, but that's the way the, the bigger picture, the strategic, uh, differentiation uh, comes about. The, the strategic value comes in taking the appropriate risks because if you can't do that, then you're not innovating, and which means you're going to drop behind and you're going to fail overall as an organization. So it's important to internalize that and realize that you know what's the worst that can happen if you do something in an agile way. Well, the worst that can happen is you'll have to fail fast and try something different. That's the worst that can happen. The worst that can happen if you do things the old way is your business can go belly up. So which is worse? So I, I like to use the analogy of building a house when people talk to me about that. And it's, you would never, you would never say, okay, I'm, I got my plans ready to go, I'm gonna build a house, and then just let the carpenters go and never check in it again and then show up at the end. 
you, you go every day or every week and you look at it and you say, hey, does, I thought that window looked good there, but I don't really want it there. I thought this was going to work how it is. It's not really the direction I wanted to go to. And you make the changes as you go along. You don't want to make the change after you've already drywalled the electrical and the duct work and everything in the place. It's way more expensive to try to change and move then. If you're, if you're agile enough that you can do things as you're going along, you end up where you need to be with a much, a much more usable product. Awesome, Connor. And then another key component that I think the whole market is facing is recruiting. If you want to get people who are innovative, who are coming out of college, who are interested in the industry, the things they're used to is agile. They're used to hackathons. They're used to this startup mentality where they want this quicker process. They don't want to wait 18 months to be able to deliver something, to be able to be proud of a product. And it's just important in the agile side of things that human nature is got two elements to it that are rock solid. One is that we don't like to change, and two is we always expect more of others than we would ever expect of ourselves. <laughs> uh, but you know, when you go to Agile, it's not an issue of training. That's, that's, it's, it's an issue of culture. I mean, every job changes in a material way, and people have got to be inspired to actually use it in ways that actually become productive for the business. And I think people, people lose that. There's a lot of energy, a gravity in human nature that keeps things like going to Agile, you know, having a significant mark on a business. So the last thing was tools. That, did, you know, can you use tools from 1965 from a NASA movie to make this kind of situation work or not? Well, Thoughts? going off the same thing with recruiting, if you want to bring someone in who hasn't necessarily had that much mainframe experience in schools, you know, there are a few schools that are supporting it, but it's not widely taught, and you want them to be up to speed right away, you need to give them something that they're at least somewhat familiar with so you take away you know, that it's, it's the mainframe and you have to learn the syntax, but your tool set is generally similar. That's, right. That's absolutely right. And, and you know, I speak at colleges and you know, I constantly hear from these deans that you know, the best kids want to go to the startups, the next tier want to go to the usual suspects in terms of the cloud providers that you hear about all the time. And then the third one, the third layer wants to work in enterprise IT. And he made the point that there's no awesome kid that gets up the day after he graduates and says, boy, I want to work in IT at Montgomery Wards. And that would be stupid because that company doesn't <laughs> exist. So he doesn't pass the IQ test either. But you got to create an environment that allows them to feed on that, you know, startup desires and, you know, being aggressive in terms of using these new tool sets. That's what's going to draw them in, right? Otherwise, it's going to be a garlic to a vampire in terms of what they see and run away from the place as fast as they could. Ken, so other things in terms of tools? Well, for, for the junior people, being, having the right tools to, to attract people is very important because uh, junior people are only going to know a few tools and they're, uh, they're going to be more comfortable with those. For the more senior people, it becomes really a question of the right tool for the job. Right, whether it's the tool itself, you know, the, the development environment, or the language, or the, the system, uh, uh, the more senior people are going to understand. Well, you know, maybe Java is good over here, maybe you know, uh, COBOL is good over there, depending upon the situation, or you know, maybe the mainframe versus distributed or, uh, is appropriate, uh, and that and that's an important kind of uh, consideration to encourage. And it's part of this uh, you know, breaking down of silos as well, that you know, mainframes are good for certain things, distributed is good for other things, and you don't want to use one when the other one is the better tool. Uh, and that's true for, for all of the tools at whatever level you're talking about. Okay. What I was going to say one of the things that you know, we find is you know, cheap tools are, are cheap tools. You know, the, the cheaper the tool, it might do the job for that instance, but if you have to spend so much of your time as a programmer um, or a manager managing that tool, managing the resources, managing you know, the, the stuff around it, as opposed to purchasing uh, a robust tool, you know, feature rich, you know, it may cost more, but if it's enterprise deployable, it's, it, it, it manages itself. So then your programmers, all they have to do is focus on the product the code. They don't have to go, oh, okay, now I've finished the product, now I've got to do 14 steps to manage the tool to, to test my product or do all those type of things. Uh, that's a lot of time waste for an organization uh, to, to have to manage various tools if they're not enterprise solutions. Awesome. There, uh, one last uh, perspective on this. Uh, there, you know, there, we get comments when we do webcasts and things of that nature from you know, people and customers in the marketplace. And there's one that haunts me constantly. I have nightmares about it. But the comment was is that, 
You know, I'm sick and tired of seeing these more modern tools applied to the mainframe. A green screen was good enough for me, it should be good enough for them. What is it, and I, I know it verbatim, I've read it 5,000 times, it haunts me. Uh, but that is the essence of the apathy issue to a certain extent. I mean, that is the, that's the person that doesn't want to go over the bridge. So what would you say to somebody that says something like that? I mean, maybe Connor would be. Yeah, probably some people here at Chair desk check their punch cards. And <laughs> that, that might have been good enough for them, but we advanced the platform. And maybe, you know, your PC3270 is good enough for some people, but we're trying to advance the platform. We're not being okay with what we have. We're trying to make something better. Yeah, and then Gary's idea was a person that had been working on a product for 30 years and seeing that something new had to be invented to basically handle the scale of work and the type of work he was trying to do. So thank you all very much, appreciate the input. So again, the, the gist of the presentation was to say that I believe there's one big single issue preventing the mainframe from progressing, and that is apathy. And that is apathy amongst all parts of the industry. It is not limited to any sector. I think the mainframe vendors are apathetic. I think a lot of the contacts within the customers are apathetic. I think the analysts, the analysts themselves, are apathetic. And it is really that, more than anything else, that is the barrier towards making the mainframe more viable within our enterprise IT. And I told you earlier, in terms of when we went through those facts, you can make really bad decisions if you don't exploit the mainframe to the fullest possible extent in the digital economy. Because the digital economy means you've got to be dense on the back end. And the mainframe is the biggest and best platform for a lot of the work. Not everything. You know, the system of engagement, things that are closer to the end user, I totally agree. The mainframe is probably the right, not the right and best place. But we all collectively do a disservice to Fortune 2000 companies, governmental organizations, when we don't accept a cultural change, right, to do and be inspired to invent on the mainframe platform. That is key. We gotta get pumped up. You know, we can't just rest on our laurels and talk about all these virtues that we've created over 50 years. That was great, but that was yesterday. We gotta add to it. We gotta make this mainframe more agile, more nimble. We gotta be more like the open systems not less like as time goes on. And in doing that, and trying to empower a new for workforce that some of which are existing, and try to re-energize them to even do greater things, or trying to recruit a new workforce, you gotta have tools that equal the challenge. So again, I think the mainframe can prosper, but we gotta, gotta kill this virus. So thank you very much. O'Connor, you wanna make one quick point? Oh, uh, if you are interested in learning more about Agile and some of the different things that have occurred within Compure, we actually have our director of product development, David Rizzo, is doing a session uh, immediately after this in Oceanic 8 on four myths, debunking the four myths of Agile development. So, so we got one minute and 20 seconds left. I'll take a question from the audience. You want to give me one? <laughs> I can't answer anything in a minute and 20 seconds. It's actually, it's actually over. Any questions? <laughs> Reg, you got to have a question, man. Come on. No questions? Say again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me. I, I'll, I'll take it because we won't have enough time otherwise. But, uh, you know, they are in conflict. I mean, they, they fight one another. And that's why, you know, it's, it's incredibly important I believe that we push the agenda of Agile as quickly as we can, because there's a lot of smart people that are here that can help get across that bridge to how to find ways to have to make these things in conflict. I fear, you know, and one of the issues that I think is really scary in the industry, I mean, we always talk about this um, transitioning workforce, right, where the, there's, you know, I was at, at a major retailer and they think between in the next three to four years, 70 to 80 percent of the people will change. I mean, they, that, that's a massive change. It's in those brains uh, that are inspired, right? They can't be the way they've always been in cynics, why we can't do it, is the smarts by which you can figure out how to make these things congruent, not incongruent. Um, and, and one of the things that it got me really excited, when we had Gary's idea, Right? We have a lot of people at CompuWare that have been there for 30, 40 years. I mean, we had somebody that celebrated their 43rd anniversary with the company recently. And I know they're all smart and wonderful and, and they're, they're incredible. But when we put Gary's idea out there, 
All these people that I kind of knew were so aggressive in figuring out the right approaches to make it work in kind of not compromising any of the past virtues of the platform. And I'm like, oh my God, if, we could, if you can tap into that now, you can create some incredible ways to bridge to the future to not create the risk in going from ITIL to, to Agile. If you wait too long, if you wait another three years and you lose all of that knowledge, I mean, you could create some massive problems because you're right, these, these processes are incongruent. So as much as you know, we, in, invention is a form of new products, you know, I try to tell my team, invention is also making Agile and ITIL to work together. It is, how do we do support better when every, you know, 80% of our users and administrators of our products have changed? I mean, if we do support the same way we do today, I mean, the place will be on fire. I mean, could you imagine if, if the number of calls went up by tenfold? I'm like, we can't do it the old way. So innovation comes in a lot of different flavors. So it's not a direct answer to your question because it's a long one, but um, I, I do think the smarts to do it rest within your organization, but the people, that understand ITIL, that naturally would fight it and say you can't do Agile, need to be the ones to inspire to figure it out. And you can do it. I mean, my whole point is CompuWare is doing it. I mean, we changed the company on a dime. Um, and the company's performing better. So you know, most people would say what we do is in, impossible. And I'm trying to make an example of the industry that nothing breaks. I mean, the mainframe is an incredibly sustainable thing. I mean, it's hard to break it. But there's a lot of fear in, in taking that step. And I think if you have an aggressive disposition, you can, you can have miracles happen. Any other questions? So we encourage people like you and like who have to, to be an evangelist for the product, the, the, for, the, for the platform. Tell people what they can do. Innovate, show, show the different things. Like show them what ZOS Connect would do or what other things they can do. Um, they the, the other side has been spending years evangelizing all of the important benefits of theirs, and we need to have a momentum of people that talk about what the momentum and make it not so much of a black box. Expose it so that they can see what it is. So, so you know, and, and I, this isn't a pitch for CompuWare, but we've made um, some tools to help in the situations you're talking about. So. I talk about these new age CIOs who, who didn't get those jobs because they know the mainframe, right? They know analytics, they know mobile, they know the cloud. And, and leaders tend to embrace those things that they know about and they push away those things that they don't understand, right? Because they want to mitigate their risk of lack of understanding of the platform. And that contributes to the mainframe kind of going down and you know, basically a hierarchy of enterprise IT. So we created this thing called the Mainframe Manifesto which is a document that you know, we encourage customers to give to their CIOs, get a way to get it to them. And if they read it, it basically paraphrases a lot of the ideas that I've thrown out here and try to get them to look at the mainframe in a different light. We also have this webcast, which is the Dr. Howard Rubin study, which is shocking. I mean, people inherently are told the mainframe is more expensive, it's cheaper. But in there, he talks about the fact that you're kind of at a crossroads in terms of the density of IT resources compute resources that are gonna be necessary to make this thing work, and a, a open systems distributed environment as the back end to those kind of efforts in ways that should be done by a mainframe can be cataclysmic. So there's a bunch of artifacts that are on our website that allow you basically not, it's not a copywork pitch, it is basically directed and trying to relook at the mainframe. But I will, I will say to you, and, and any of the mainframe vendors that are in this room, you gotta help the guy. I mean, this is, it's our fault. That's the case. I mean, it's IBM's fault, it's, it's CompuWare's fault, it's BMC's fault, it's CA's fault. We all stink at being advocates for the platform the way that we should. So, you know, I encourage you guys to not sit there and hold yourselves in an apathy, apathetic state and leave it to the customers to fight this fight alone. I mean, that's not the way this is gonna be changed. So. I, I, we're doing everything we can as a thought leader to try to give you those assets. I, I encourage everybody to look at them. They're incredibly good documents. I mean, I've had customers take those as CIO wrote, read it, and he actually gave it to the board of directors of his company. So again, I, I think it's a, a good way for you to help kind of resurrect the mainframe in, in, in your sites. So I think we gotta go. Thank you very much. Just